director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs here at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. Uh, this is one of our program, speakers programs in the Scowcroft Institute for this year. I'm pleased to introduce a, a, uh, a remarkable woman who is a nun in the Order of Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, based in Juba, South, South Sudan. My wife is Roman Catholic. Two of her aunts were nuns. One was the head of the Marinol nuns in Central America during the 90s, during the wars. She's threatened a number of times. And then she was all, the other nun was in uh, the Philippines, I believe, for her life. But so I'm very familiar from my wife's uh, telling me stories about uh, her aunt and her family. So um, I know Uganda a little bit, not as much as, as my friend. She spoke this morning to my class uh, on international development and was uh, made a remarkable impression on our students. Uh, for the last 30 years, she's been a nun. She, uh, the mother house uh, is in Juba. Juba is the capital of South Sudan, which is just north of Uganda. And, uh, but her center, as you hear, is, is, in, uh, is in northern Uganda. She answered the call to serve the least among us from the epicenter of a bloody and violent civil war that decimated both South Sudan for 20 years in South Sudan, two, we estimate 2.4 million people died in Sudan, South Sudan during the Civil War, and of course the Civil War in Northern Uganda, which she will talk about this evening. Armed with only a sewing machine, Sister Rosemary openly defied Joseph Kony, a psychopath, I would say, maybe I'm being too judgmental, Sister. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, and rebel soldiers. I remember I went to her, to her province in 1989, it was my first trip to Africa, as an official of the United States Agency for International Development under President Bush 40, President Bush 41, our President Bush. And uh, I didn't know very much about uh, Joseph Kony, but the villagers were telling me stories that, that uh, he would uh, rub uh, oil on the, uh, on the front, the, the chests of people, and he'd tell them if someone shot a bullet at them, the bullet would bounce off. And, and then he would rub copper. He, the villagers told me he rubbed copper, and people did the same thing. And I don't know why they would believe him, but many of them were children. They didn't understand this stuff, and they believed it. And um, it was a reign of terror for 20-odd years. Uh, since 2002, Sister Rosemary has en en enrolled more than 2,000 girls who had been previously kidnapped by the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, or abandoned by their families. Anyone who steps foot on the grounds of the St. Monica campus in Gulu, Uganda, will instantly recognize there are a few places on earth where a community of women learn to become self-reliant and change agents for peace and prosperity. There's a book about her, you can get it. My wife belongs to a small uh, uh, book group of other women in College Station, and they read this book, Sewing hope, and so I, 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 she said, oh, she's coming <laughs> uh, in person. But it's a, a remarkable book to read, and, uh, and Sister Rosemary was telling me that she, she just got her PhD in Oklahoma last May, and her PhD dissertation, you can, she can maybe tell you a little bit about the dissertation that she got. Um, but she's got five honorary PhDs, and she's be, been named a, a fellow at Georgetown University, uh, and so we're gonna hear from her and her experiences. Thank you, Sister Rosemary. Howdy. <laughs> I got it, I know that's how you greet here and I'm very happy I landed on arrival. I'm so happy for the first time that I'm here in this place, and uh, thank you so much for the introduction. You said many things, but don't think about all those things. Now that you have me in front of you, I'll just share with you my life story and what you will hear. Maybe some of you have already heard about it. Some people might not have heard about it, but I always say it is still part of my life and part of where I come from. He called my name Sister Rosemary, and the last name is called Nyirombe. 
I always emphasize that name because it has a beautiful meaning, which I came to know later. Nyirumbe means the girls are not visible. And I never thought about it until I started standing for the visibility of women and girls. I was born and raised in Northern Uganda. And by the time I got a call that I wanted to become a nun, I was very young. I was the babysitter to the children of my sisters. And I think God sometimes calls you exactly from where you are. God called me and presented to me a group of nuns who came from South Sudan as refugees to Uganda. And what attracted me to join this, nun was, this group of nuns was that they were taking care of vulnerable children and orphans and women. And I thought that was something very attractive for me because as a babysitter, I knew I was going to continue with the children. But what I didn't know was that I was maybe asking God to give me something else to do. And definitely, growing up among the nuns, it was very difficult. Yesterday I was sharing with somebody, with people I was, Father Jim and others, that the most difficult thing I found for me on arrival in the convent to become a nun was just the difficulties of getting up every day at 5.30. Because I'm a very good sleeper, and I would hear a big bell ringing every morning, and I asked myself, how long am I going to do this? <laughs> this is crazy. You can't get up at 5.30. But eventually, I got used to it, and I realized in between that, as I kept on growing, God kept on calling me to do different things, but which was not different from what I wanted to do. My life remained focused on supporting the most vulnerable, and especially women and children, until I reached a point when the war or the Lord's resistance army, I hope some of you heard about it, or all of you heard about it, broke out. But I had already gone through the different conflicts in Uganda. I was already used to conflict. I was already used to the question of Presidents coming in and destroying one another, killing people, children running away from home. But I was not used to what the Lord's Resistance Army were doing. The Lord's Resistance Army targeted women and children specifically. Although they were taking also young boys, trained them as child soldiers, the women had more problems because they were used as sex slaves, they were raped, they were forced sometimes to kill their own friends, their siblings, and they were forced to commit terrible atrocities. That is the difference I found with the rebels of the Lord's Resistance Army. A lot of people in northern Uganda were left without lips. These people would cut the lips of people. They would cut arms. And all these were being done by children who were intimidated, children who were indoctrinated. In fact, many people were wondering and would ask questions, say, how is it that the government of Uganda could not intervene? In the beginning, even the government thought this was a kind of war which will stop because this very group of people we are fighting in their own district, in their own town, and they're fighting their own people. So they thought it would stop, but it didn't stop. It went on and on and took a lot of people and impacted so negatively on the whole community and eventually it impacted on the whole country. I was sent to Gulu where the war was at the height at that time and when my superiors sent me to this school called St. Monica, they actually told me that they were sorry. They apologized. They said, we are sorry to send you there because you have already experienced some problems and we know you are traumatized, but there is no way we want to send you there. And I told them, I said, if God wants me to go there, I will go. I packed my own things. I drove the pickup and went there and I settled from 2002 until today, I remained there. 
Maybe my acceptance, the act of obedience I give to the superiors has become a challenge that they find it so difficult to take me away. But it's not about taking me away or anything. It is about the difficulties, the experience in that place. Working with young women and children who were totally indoctrinated and accepting them to come to this center, not because we want to give them education, but because we want them to experience love, sympathy, and acceptance. Because most of these children were mistaken by their own relatives, they were scared of seeing these children coming back home, and rightly so, because the children were trained and taught to commit terrible atrocities. So in that way, I just decided that I would just accept these children and also tell other sisters that this is the mission God is giving us. And so one morning, I just thought, it would be good for us to make an announcement, put it on radio, and invite these women who are escaping from captivity to come to our center with their children. Come as you are, that was my statement. Come with your children. If you are pregnant, come. If you have one or two children, bring them along. I didn't know I was inviting more problems, but they came anyway. I got many women who came with their children. And so my next problem was, I didn't know where to put the children. I was not prepared to have a kindergarten. So I decided to look at the whole environment and I started a kindergarten under a tree. A shade of a tree, I said, sit there. And I got one woman to take care of more than 100 children. So just care for them, give time for their mothers to go to class, to rebuild their own lives. So the women were going to study a little bit of dressmaking and cutting. And this is where we find sewing, hope, becomes part of everything we do. Because we are using the analogy of a needle, which can mend broken pieces of clothes. I use that needle and machine to say, this is how these girls can mend their brokenness. They can mend their stolen childhood. And for me, that was something I kept on emphasizing that you can rebuild your life from where it seems not to exist. And you can mend these broken pieces. I was not trained as a seamstress, but I had, of course, to teach myself privately that I could teach them something. And I did so many things. It was telling you about my education level. There was no way I could use anything I learned from that. Nowhere. None. I was not educated for any of those things. But I decided to really emphasize on that sympathy, love, and compassion. And I knew there was no classroom for any of that. That is something God has put in the hearts of everybody. Accepting these women, living with them, embracing them, holding their children, and teaching them that life can be rebuilt. And that was, for me, a different form of rehabilitation. I was not trained to give rehabilitation to anybody, but I decided to have rehabilitation, give them rehabilitation through different activities, through valuing them, validating their own knowledge, being with them and say, you can do something. Your life can be better than this. And eventually, a lot of people came to realize that we even had the wives of the rebel leader, Joseph Cohen. I hope many of you have heard about him and knowing he had more than 20 wives. Those are the ones I knew, but there were so many. And most of these children came with their mothers. They were in our center. We didn't tell anybody that these are the wives of the rebel leader. Because for me at this point, I was looking at the innocence of children the innocence of these women, and we wanted these women to embrace these children they got from very, very difficult situation, especially rape. We wanted these women not to turn anger on these children, and that means we had to adopt these women and embrace them fully. That's all what I've been spending my time doing. 
And when it came to sewing with the machine, I thought I said, honestly, these girls were taught how to destroy life with machine guns. Now we need to teach them how to use the sewing machine to bring back life. And the life they are to bring back is their own life. Because they themselves were totally broken. They never believed anybody would accept them. And for many years, we took in these girls, we took in their children, and to these days, as I speak, you may ask me, say, now the war has stopped, what are you doing? I was telling somebody, just think of this conflict which lasted for 20 years or more. Think of the impact it has left on people. Do you think we can just do rehabilitation and you complete it within a short time? I think the rehabilitation of these young women and children will last more than 20 years. The impact of this conflict will remain on these people. Gunshots are not heard anymore, but gunshots are being heard in their hearts. They are still feeling the pain. The memory is there. And in fact, I'm just starting a new program. We are trying to think of working towards healing of memories. We need these people to begin to think of how they can heal their memories because they will live with it. But we do not want them to revenge. We do not want them to feel also their trash. We want to value them. And we want them to be members of the society. And you may wonder, you may ask me, how was I doing all this? I didn't have like money. Money is not what to start with. Start with that compassion. Start with that acceptance. Start with that love. And start with walking and showing people the path that leads to hope. And in this case, I think my faith played a big role. To just think that we would be there, relying only on God's providence, God's care. That was all where I say our faith has led us to do what we have been doing and continue leading us to do what we shall continue doing. But the challenge remains. I tell people every time, and I will not stop telling, that when you hear about these kind of situations, some people even just put it aside, say, okay, it has happened, or oh, it is very far away in Africa, what does it have to do with me? And I think some of you watched the video on, about me with the Steve Colbert. That's exactly what he said. Say, what have I got to, why should I worry about something which is happening in Africa? And I said, Dale, I didn't have a, a, a response for him. Something came spontaneously and said, if you don't bother about that, the only thing I can do to you is to punch you. <laughs> and he said, you a nun can punch me. I said, yes, I can punch you. <laughs> because Africa is part of the humanity which you must care about, which you must bother about. So why should you not care? And I keep on telling everybody, do not even run away from hearing or from finding out about the situation which happened very far away from you because one day it might take you by surprise that it is at your doorstep. What will you do? What are the tools? How prepared are you for this? And I mean, I'm talking, but it has already happened. We have seen what has happened in Ukraine. He said not exactly what has been happening in Africa. Why should we be afraid of hearing? Why should we be afraid of getting involved? You may look at yourself that I am just a one person and I'm only small, I can't do much. Who told you you cannot do much? Have you taken a step to solve a problem? Have you ever tried to solve the problem of one child, of one woman, of one person? Have you ever thought your own life can transform a bigger community? when you start moving. As long as we remain in our comfort zones, we shall always create that blockage. We shall not want to know what is going on in the lives of other people. But now, 
Everything is open. You can learn, you can hear, and let us not remain all the time pretending like Steve Colbert. Why should I think about other people? We have to think. We have to get involved. I'm very, very glad that this time I'm invited here to speak. And when I speak, I tell everybody I'm inviting you to get involved. I'm really bold on that one. Get involved. If you ask me how can we get involved, I, do, I may not have the answer. Because that is something we need to work together in partnership. We need to find a solution together. There are a lot of problems in the world. And I can talk and tell you stories over stories. You may hear stories of pain, stories of despair, but there are also stories of hope. Because much as you see me, one person remaining in the same situation from 2002 until now, that is enough to tell you there is hope and faith. We can do something together. We can remain in that situation. Sometimes I have bigger dreams, and I said, okay, even now, the big dreams I had are not fulfilled. I have got the temptation of saying I'm a failure. I have the temptation of saying, Okay, I'm biting too big. I cannot swallow what I'm biting. But it's not true. I'm realizing that timing is all belonging to God. The right time for my bigger dreams will come. I dream very greatly that we must develop and create a sustainable model for all the people we are working with. They must have that hope that life can change. So what are the sustainable models? One of the things which I work with in the house here, which none of you has asked me, is this. This was. You didn't ask me because you thought I was a model, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I am a model. This purse is speaking. That is my talking tool. This purse is made from trash, the sort of cans. And I found it very, very useful. It goes very well with all what we are saying. We are sowing hope. It's made by these women. We give them money when they make this. And that is how we are training them to become self-reliant and supportive to their own children. It is not about giving. It's not about somebody coming to ask me, can I get this? No. It's about educating people. It's about letting them know they can work. Their destiny is in their own hands. They must have the dignity of work. So this is my model, and you can get involved with this one. I've been getting this from college students and many organizations collecting for me pop-tabs. And I think that collection of pop ups is really a great involvement of love. How do they reach? We'll find out how they reach me. But it's very important for you to do something. So if anyone among you is drinking beer, fine, drink it with love. Keep the pop ups Thank you so much. <laughs> I, what I'd like to do at this point is what I did this morning with my own class. What's the background of this? How did this happen? Joseph Coney killed probably 100,000 people. You're all wondering, did you just go around and kill people? I mean, there, there's, there's some logic behind it. There's a, a, a historical events. And so I'd like uh, you, Sister Rosemary, if, if you could explain a little bit about the history of Uganda that led to Coney's rise and the Lord's Resistance Army, and then uh, maybe I can even uh, go into what uh, 
our, the U.S. government has done to try to capture him unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. But they have broken up the movement through uh, troops, Ugandan troops that were trained by U.S. Special Forces. He's still alive. He's, he's got 100 troops left. He used to have 3,000. And he's somewhere in the, the Central African Republic in a village, but he's in very poor health now. But could you explain how did he rise? How did this terrible situation uh, evolve? Yeah, I think some of you have known that Uganda is a, a young country that got independence only in 1962. And uh, before that independence, it was a British colony. And of course, the British had to bring up somebody who they would hand power to. And they got a man from northern Uganda, from Lango, a tribe which is very close to, very near Choli area. And this is the man who was trained by the British and eventually they handed power to him as a prime minister and he became the president of the country, the first president. But there was a string attached to that. It was on religion background because this guy was from the Anglican church and of course that is what the British valued. They put him, he became the president, that's fine. But they also trained one military guy as his bodyguard, and that was Idi Amin, who many of you heard about. And definitely Idi Amin was a shrewd military officer, well trained. <laughs> Eventually, he overthrew the president, and he became the president himself, with little education, but highly trained as a military. And so this actually followed the whole background of Uganda's history, in northern Uganda itself, a lot of people are very low in education. The British actually preferred southern people, the people from the south, they were more educated, while the people in northern Uganda were mostly kept to go to work in sugar plantation or doing law jobs and so forth. But again, they were mostly involved in military. So a lot of people in northern Uganda knew uh, how to handle the guns, just like Idi Amin came in. And of course, when Idi Amin came, he committed a lot of atrocities, killed a lot of people, especially from the tribe of the president he hosted, and also Acholi people. Later on, another person came and overthrew Idi Amin with the help of uh, military from uh, Tanzania. After we, with the drawing, he decided to go somewhere else, but Northern Uganda never remained at peace. By all means, the people of Northern Uganda wanted to head the government. They wanted to be in the military as presidents, as leaders. And eventually, we got one woman called Alice Lapuena, who came up and started a movement called the Holy Spirit Movement. The whole idea was these people would work and restore the Ten Commandments. And Alice Lapuena lasted for some time. The whole thing was what you explained, put oil on your body, bullets will not penetrate if you are shot and so forth. Later on, Alice Lapuena was also chased she ran to exile, and her own cousin came and took up her mission, and the cousin was called Joseph Cohen. That is how the whole trend of event continued. Joseph came in a very brutal manner. He actually, you see the name is Joseph, and if you ask what is really the Christianity behind the name Joseph, and what is it about the Ten Commandments they are trying to restore? They couldn't explain. The whole thing was about killing people, committing different atrocities, while at the same time claiming they are restoring the Ten Commandments. And that is exactly what went on and on for more than 20 years. There were so many children who had to move away from their homes every day as night commuters to run away from being abducted, run away from being killed. That is the history, the background history of the Lost Resistance Army in Northern Uganda. 
And uh, what happened, uh, President Obama sent about 100 special forces in. Uh, they got a special appropriation from Congress that was approved unanimously and legislation approving this unanimously. And they went in and trained the Ugandan army to, with a special unit that President Museveni deployed to try to capture him, Kony. And he escaped to Central African Republic where he remains now. But he is ineffective. The, the movement is at an end, I think it's fair to say. But he has not actually been arrested and put on trial yet for war crimes. But the big, the reason Sister Rosemary is here is, is, to, is to go through, as she has, what do you do to rehabilitate people who've had committees, commi uh, violence committed against them, particularly girls who've been raped and had to deliver the children, <clears throat> and they're bringing up the children. Uh, and, and many, uh, and not this, the perception is this just goes on in Africa. I've seen it in, uh, in went on in Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. Uh, the, the, the defense ministry, um, just quoting what they said, the Minister of Defense in Moscow announced that they were taking 1.375 million Ukrainian women and children and moving them to Sakhalin Island, which is in the Pacific Ocean. It's a Russian part of Russia. It's 10,000 miles away. They say they're going to be safe there. Well, Human Rights Watch went into the camps where they're in. They said the conditions are deplorable, the food is inadequate, the housing is inadequate, and all of these women have had their passports taken away, and there's violence against them. So this is going on right now, and not in Uganda, but in, in, in Ukraine. And, and, and there are international conventions on this, but ultimately violence is, unfortunately, exists wherever there's war going on. And it's not just violence between soldiers. 90% of the violence to nowadays is against civilians, and that's the problem. It's not soldier versus soldier, it's soldier versus civilian. And that's what you've had to, to deal with, is the memory of this violence. So let me ask you, I'm gonna ask you some questions that I asked this morning, and you answered them very directly. You're not gonna try to punch me though, you, you <laughs> promised me, you won't do that, right? If you say what I don't agree with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Stephen Colbert, I wouldn't mind if you, anyway, I shouldn't say that. But um, uh, now you, you have, except for very small boys who are the children of, of the women who've been abused, um, only have girls in the program. And I think you should explain why you only have girls in the program. And you're, you've changed that a little bit, but I, 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 you have a very good explanation for it, because you've been criticized for that. Why don't you explain your rationale, your, your philosophy? I just have girls only, but it, I will tell you where it is changing a little bit. The first time I had all these women who were abused, raped, and got children from different rebel leaders all coming to the center, I had to carefully control male presence, even among the teachers because it would remind these girls of whatever happened to them, and they would not trust whatever we would be telling them. So I decided that it would be better for me not to mix up issues, bring men. I wanted these women to have a safe place where they could discuss what it means to be even a mother, even mother of children got during rape, how they can accept these children again, and what they can do to support one another. I had started a small group of men and women who came from captivity, and I realized eventually that the men in the group were treating the women just as they were treating them in the bush. They would force them to sit down when we had a meeting, and they were the ones who took, I said, no, that's not going to happen. I'm stopping here. I don't want men in this group. Keep away. I will keep all the girls. I still recall one time I had Scottish Catholic aid. They came to, wanted to give us some support, and they said, Sister Rosemary would like to give you some help, support to run the school, but we are afraid that you don't have boys and you are not gender sensitive and so on. <laughs> oh, I told them, you're talking about gender sensitive. I'm the most gender sensitive person. And the reason why I can tell you I'm gender sensitive is because these women you see who have been raped gave birth to boys and girls. 
and I'm keeping them. Are these not the men I'm keeping? So I think you really just have to help me anyway. <laughs> I argued on that ground, and they started giving the help. They supported our project. But again, we started a small group, which eventually became a bigger group of women from different areas, Karamoja, Soroti, Nebi, Lila, all the women who are disadvantaged, we wanted them to come and address what it means to be a peace builder. How a woman can be part of peace building in northern Uganda. This group of women would come every year in June and we have some students from Oklahoma University who come and can join and support them like with the record taking and so forth. Eventually, I hear people started complaining Sister is doing all this thing, and uh, they're not getting men. Men would like to join and so forth. And I say, OK, let us talk about it. So we came to an agreement that every group will bring one man who is gender sensitive. And if that man comes, his role will be to keep silent <laughs> and listen to issues affecting women. So we have done it for two years. We really are carefully controlling. This is because we want these women to have their dignity. We want them to have that space, a safe space, where they can discuss, they can speak freely. But we love the children. We love those little boys. We are pointing to the little boys a future, a different future. We don't want to mix up too many things. So that is my simple rationale. Very good explanation. So, after in 1991, Mengistu, who was the Marxist dictator of Ethiopia, responsible for the death of millions of people, literally, in the civil wars that went on, and in the famine of 1985 that killed maybe 900,000 people, and I, I think he was indirectly responsible for the number of deaths in the famine. Uh, he was overthrown by Mela Sinawi, the rebel leader, who served for 20 years as president, who was, he suppressed civil society, arrested opponents and all that, but Mela Sinawi built the country. He was a statesman, a repressive statesman, but he, he did good things for Ethiopia. When, after he was, uh, Mengistu was overthrown, and Mengistu, by the way, still alive with his children in uh, Zimbabwe. Mm. I don't know how he did escape war crime trials, but anyway, um, we in, in the aid community, the USAID, the European Union, the African Union, uh, the British, tried to help resettle the hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the Ethiopian army under Mengistu. And we found the villages did not want the young men back because they had killed people, even though we took all their guns away from them. And uh, it was, we, it was a, we didn't know what to do. What are we going to do with all these young men? Have them running around the cities uh, unemployed? Uh, it would be dangerous. And they didn't have skills. Most of them were farm boys. So uh, one of the issues I'd like to raise with you is what is it, because some of these girls have committed violence. You reported mm -hmm. in, your book, in the book yeah. about you. Yeah. Uh, uh, why don't you tell that story about one girl being in the same room, and the girl realized she had killed the parents yeah. of one of the other girls. So when you tell that story, but um, you, you told me this morning that you were experiencing the same problem with these girls. The villagers don't want them back. So the purpose of the training program is to give them a skill that will allow them to be self-supportive if they can't go back to their own village. Yes, and actually, it's not only that, we also have our own traditional belief that when a girl comes with a child from somewhere, you don't know the background, the child is not easily accepted. Because whose child? Who is, where is the clan of this child? And so this is mostly affecting the boys. And in fact, I'm glad you reminded me of that. This is bringing for us a very big challenge now. We have got a big group of street kids for the first time. We didn't have children on the street. Now we have children on the street. And actually, I started working with when this. When you say on the street, you mean in Kampala? In Gulu, in Gulu. In Gulu. Gulu. On the, yeah. I started working with a small group, but I didn't want to throw my weight to start talking with them. I decided my, to enroll some of my students. I spoke with them. I asked them if they knew how to go to those 
children on the street. And they told us, they told me, sister, we can go because some of them are our friends. We know them. And I said, that's good. Bring them slowly. Discuss with them here in St. Monica why they are on the street and write for me those points down. And one thing which surprised me is that these children started accepting some of the students because they know them, they met before. They started telling that we came, one of them said, we came on the street because we were born from girls who are abducted by rebels and we have nowhere to settle. We don't have a clan we belong to. So the best place for us is to be on the street. And some of the girls who are on the street also mentioned, they said, some of us have to come here and find a way how we can make ends meet. And that means even if we become prostitutes, at least we can survive. We know people are exploiting us. Some of the children even mentioned that they were being hired by politicians because they have nowhere to go. So politicians hired them to antagonize their opponents. And so they remain on the street and they pay little. Uh, I'm trying my best to try to work with these kids to see how they can come out. We ask them, what do you think would be good for you? They say, if you could give us some training, some skills training, that would be good. So that for me was a great thing because they have a desire to do something and I know that giving them that part of literacy, that education, the skills can easily make them become self-supporting. They can become self-reliant. And this is what we are doing with the women also. They are not being accepted. They were not accepted in the society with their children. A good number of them, actually some of them who are being trained, I one time told, I say, girls, what we are teaching you now should be what you should learn and you should get married to these skills because they will support you for the rest of your life. You are not going to go to get married to someone, yet you have three children of a rebel leader and you don't know the father. So get these skills, get this education. So that is what we are trying our best to do. Give the skills to these women, make them become self-supporting and begin to support their own children. And some of them have really settled and some are people who are now speaking in other places. There's one woman, she's actually, she was the wife of Joseph Cohen. Now she goes into different places speaking and talking about. Oh, really? Yes. And she was in our school. Hmm. Yeah. So if you, any of you have questions, uh, uh, Dr. Dweek, pass out the cards. Yes? Okay, so if you have questions, write them down. Please pass them to either end of your row, and then the Bush School ambassadors will pick them up. I'll bring them up and I'll go through them. Some of them may be repetitive, um, but please write them down and I'll ask Sister Rosemary. Let me ask you another question. You talk about clans. You, you mean tribes? Tribes. Oh, no, no, no. Tribes are big. Clans yes. are small. Smaller. Yeah. Okay, so these are sub-tribes. Yeah. Of. Okay. And, uh, and Culturally, you ha must have a clan you belong to. Yes. And for us, that is very important. They said, where you were born, where your umbilical cord was buried is your clan. Yes. That's where you belong. So where do these children belong? Nobody knows where they belong. And that's one of the problems is they don't have an identity. They don't have an identity. Exactly. Yes. And that is, in our culture, which is more individualistic, people can move and you never know the history of someone when they move halfway across the country. That is not the case in, in many developing countries, not just in Africa, but in other areas, but particularly in countries that have gone through civil war mm -hmm. with a lot of violence against women, you have uh, people who don't have an identity. And as yeah. a result of that, they cannot go back to their tribe or their clan or their sub-tribe for, for support. Because typically what happens, uh, in my experience, is the first thing that happens when there's displacement or refugees is people go to their, their native tribe or yeah. their, their clan and they, they'll take them in. I mean, that's just the tradition. That's one of the coping mechanisms to survive massive amounts of repression and violence. And if you don't have that 
identity, then you are severely at risk because that's what the people survive on. Okay. Yeah, and some of these children actually do not even have national identity card because you ask you, who is your father? It's very difficult to say my father was so and so. Yes. They might even be afraid to reveal the names. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Could you talk about the Acholi <coughs> Religious Leaders Peace Initiative, which you talked about this morning, mm -hmm. which is very, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. This is a group of uh, different religious leaders, Protestants, Muslims, Orthodox, different groups decided to come together to address the peace and reconciliation process. And eventually they, then they started being called a Choli Religious Leaders Peace Initiative. These people actually at one time had the courage to go up to Joseph Kony himself in the bush to meet him. And they were the ones who worked together with the Betty Bigombe. I'm sure you know about Betty yes. Bigombe. To start the peace process. She the was peace a talk. UN envoy, I think, from the Secretary General who was sent in to try to mediate talks. On yes. This. She, she's Ugandan. Is yes, she? she's yes, Ugandan. She, but she's an official of the United Nations yeah. and has the imprimatur of the Secretary General. But she's been doing this for a long time. For a long time, yeah. yeah. But then this report really are very deeply focused on the process of reconciliation using also traditional method. The traditional way of reconciliation is what they call mataput. That means people have to sit round together and there's one calabash where you have to drink all from. So whether you have killed, you have not killed, you are an enemy of somebody, you drink from that one calabash. That is the process. And if you read about it, there's a long way that they explain about it. But then these religious leaders also started working together with the traditional leaders. Because in our cultures, in Africa, most cultures, the traditional chiefs are very well respected. And so these people have taken up the question of reconciliation. Until today, they are even working for mediation, they are working addressing the need of reconciliation in their communities until today. And I think that is something which the actual religious leaders, peace initiatives started which is going on up to today. So I, I just to tell you a story in Western Equatoria, which is the part of South Sudan closest to the Ugandan border. And I was in one of the villages and I said, when a government official comes from the South Sudanese government, what do you do? And they said, well, they usually call meetings and none of us go because they're corrupt, abusive, and stupid, as they put it to me. And uh, I said, what happens when a bishop of the Catholic Church or the Anglican Church or the Lutheran Church or a Pentecostal pastor comes to the village and they call a meeting, everybody in the village comes. They said the credibility is with the religious leaders who they trust. And the religious leaders keep their distance from the government. They will pressure the government. I've watched them threaten our, our African leaders before who were being abusive. Mm -hmm. and they, they threatened Salva Kiir in the middle of yes. the massacres in 2014. Uh, yelled at him actually. When some friend of mine was in the room when, and he, uh, he, he, he broke down in tears when they started going after him, verbally at least, mm -hmm. verbally. But, um, and uh, so the religious leaders in, in uh, and this includes the Muslim leaders. The yeah. interesting thing is the, the uh, hierarchy for the Muslims is not so much with the clerical, it's with the Muslim Doctors Association, which is one of the most respected institutions among, uh, among the Muslims are the Muslim doctors who have, they can actually issue, issue fatwas. Uh, 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 Al-Qaeda was spreading rumors that if you got immunized against uh, measles or against polio uh, that your child would be uh, unable to have children when they were adults. And um, they were killing the aid workers and the local um, nurses and doctors mm -hmm. for immunizing the children. And so what we did was we went and got the Muslim Doctors Association to issue a fatwa, a religious edict, which they had the authority to do theologically, to say anybody who does not have their child immunized is in violation of the Quran. This is not for, this is not for COVID, okay? I don't want to upset people here. <laughs> this is for measles and polio. The polio vaccine's been around 70 years. It does work for lifetime immunity. 
So, um, so the religious leaders do have authority. A society. lot. They have a, a lot, lot of authority lot. and people listen to them. They do. Can you share some success stories of the girls that went through St. Monica's and then left? There are a lot of that. A lot of these girls, I can tell you, have settled. And uh, you find when sometimes I take time to walk in the market, I get a lot of these girls trying to call me to come and see their little shops they have set up. They're working. And I've not seen them coming to beg and say, Sister, can you give me this? So I feel happy to see that. And some of the children we cared for have great success story. There's one boy, I'm just waiting. His results are coming out on Friday. And I asked him, I say, Patrick, what are you expecting to get? He said, I'm expecting to get eight out of eight. And I'm expecting to get government bursary. And the boy is going to do it. I asked him, what is your plan for the future? He said, I want to become a neurosurgeon. This is a very good ambition, and I like it because this boy was abandoned by the parents. I picked him up from a tiak. He was so malnourished. Everybody was making fun, calling him, oh, this is a monkey, oh, this is a monkey. So I tell other children, I say, we are going to have one neurosurgeon called Dr. Monkey. <laughs> he is so smart, I don't know where that came from. But a good number of these children, we went through in our kindergarten. It was not about really just giving education. It was about that care, that motherly experience that we gave these children to experience, to know that somebody is holding me very tight, somebody is valuing me as a human being, which has made these children and the women, a good number of them actually, have settled and are contributing in the society now. So what is your project Healing Memories about? How are you going to help? Is there a form of therapy you're going to use? Is it, is it drawing? I've heard uh, UNICEF and some of the NGOs and the church groups use, uh, they, they have the children draw pictures of what they've witnessed as a way of getting these memories out on paper, which is a form of therapy. Or do you do it verbally? Do you, have you thought through Yeah, I think in our case we shall do more verbally to Perfect. let people really go through what they experience. Because a lot of these people who suffer so much sometimes resort to keeping quiet. They want, don't want to talk about what has happened. They don't want other people to know. But we need to bring them slowly to begin talking, narrating their own experience. And being with their friends may be very helpful because they will know they are not alone. Someone else has a same story and then they can share. This is exactly going back to the story of the girl who was put in one room. I didn't know that that girl ever committed a great atrocities like that. And uh, she came up by herself and told a friend one day, he said, I feel sorry because I was one of those who was forced to kill your parents. And now we are here together with you. And she was helping the friend to take care of her baby. The baby was very small and said, it's okay. Now that we are together, we didn't know. And for me, that was something. She told me, sister, I want to go and tell her. I say, yeah, if you can tell her, it's fine, but take your time. So it's very important to help these people to speak about their past. They have to go and know that the past is actually a bridge which does not keep them there. It is a bridge which must lead them to the future and eventually forget and eventually become somebody who can help another person. Some of the children become, uh, I don't know what the proper, but they stop talking uh, 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 at all. They will not talk yeah. uh, because they're in, in a kind of shock. Mm -hmm. and, and this doesn't go on for a few weeks. It goes on for years. For long. And it takes a while to, to get the children to begin to talk and then they can begin to verbalize what they've been through and that. But this group therapy is what you're talking about yeah. is, is very effective in mm -hmm. these conflict zones. We, we use techniques like this in the Mozambican Civil War where there were 5,000 child soldiers who committed similar atrocities to what uh, Joseph Kony had done and um, their efforts there. Uh, in fact, we are working in partnership with a group from Mozambique. Oh, you are? Yes. Ah, very good. We're just joining them. There's actually a, a, a Catholic lay order from Rome 
the, uh, the uh, Santa Agudio order Santa Agudio, of yes. Catholic laymen from Rome that adjudicated or mediated mm -hmm. the peace agreement in yes. Mozambique. Yes. I remember it going on 20, 25 mm -hmm. years ago. It was yeah. very successful, very yeah. successful. Okay, do you still have a large flow of students coming into your school and what do you do to teach them at the school? We have a good number of women coming to our school because this school is unique in that first it takes mother and child. There's no other school accepting women and their children. And the mother, another unique thing about it is that we don't care what standard of education you have been in. We take you and give you the skills according to your level. And then another thing, we don't ask about their age. We don't care what age you are, as long as you're willing to come and learn skills. Then another thing about our school is that we have started giving them literacy, reading and writing. And so that makes our school unique. In fact, last week I got on my phone, they sent me a message that 30 girls want to join, 30 young women want to join. And I say, there's space. Every year we can take 300 girls. So we take every year. They come with their children, we take them. We have enough space. I can tell you an amusing story. I went into a village in South Sudan during the Civil War. This is 20 years ago, where the atrocities were going on. And this was a safe village. And there were maybe uh, 100 boys and girls, maybe 8 to 14 years old. And they were a huge noise. It was, they were all talking and all this. And there's one headmaster mm. for the school. And it was outside. We were under a tree. And they asked me to, mm. the headmaster said, would you say something? I said, sure. So he spoke very quietly. And as soon as he spoke, there was complete silence within five seconds. I said, that would never happen in the United States. The teacher would have to scream at the kids or the principal to have them stop talking. And then he just moved his hand like this. Mr. Nancyus is going to go up and speak b below the tree to get me out of the tropical sun. And he just went like this. All of a sudden, everybody moved. He didn't do it twice or three times. He just did it once. Everybody immediately moved within 10 seconds. I said, that would never happen in the United States either. So uh, it's very interesting. The authority that the teachers have, I found in the villages in, in, uh, in Africa. Uh, the, the, anyway, um, what do you do with children who continue to be violent? Do, are some of the kids still violent? Some of the girls still violent? Or you, you said you don't have the boys, but you have them separately. No, no, we have them now. Are there any girls that are really violent still, or you don't see that as a No, baby? no. I've not really seen these girls violent anymore. And also, maybe the society was maybe so much disillusion, thinking that these girls were trained to kill and they would come to kill. They didn't. I think it was just a way that they needed to be accepted again. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sister Rosemary, for being with us. It's been very enlightening, and I think it's difficult sometimes for American con to uh, contextualize all this. Yes, you have a question. Is there a website or something to order? Stockton, can you, where are you, Stockton? <laughs> here you are. Stockton is uh, was a, he's a graduate of the Bush School. He, you work here now, don't you? Oh, no, you, that's right. You're in your second year. You're going to graduate in May. Yeah, I mean, I'll take the degree now. <laughs> Stockton was my student last year. So uh, Stockton, maybe we have, um, uh, we could post the, uh, at the Scowcroft Institute so website. No. Sewing Hope. Foundation. Sewing Hope. Yeah. Uh, that should go on the website, the, uh, just on the internet, Sewing Hope. SewingHopeFoundation.com. Sewing Hope Foundation. Foundation.com. Yeah. Okay. You all have that? Thank you all for coming. Good night. <laughs>